Hi, this is Katie from Queen's Podcast. Just a heads up, our show does include some strong language. So if you're uncomfortable with that, this might not be the show for you. Cheers, bitches. Hi, this is Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's Podcast, the show about badass women in history. Hey, Nathan. Hey, Katie. How are you doing? Good. Awesome week. Awesome life. We went to New Orleans. Awesome life. Yes, we (laughs) went to New Orleans. And we, while we were there, learned a little bit more about the queen that we are about to discuss um, her name was Marie Laveau. She was the voodoo queen of New Orleans. Many depictions of Marie through the years have kind of painted her as like this person that practiced um, evil magic. Mm-hmm. and Like so many other queens that we've like, talked yeah. about. <laughs> and it's just, it's just not true. So we want to try to discuss the real Marie as much as history will let us because yeah. she's a bit of an elusive figure, yeah, which I think very. is what she was going for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but anyway, first, Nathan, what are we drinking? We are actually drinking a drink that is called the Voodoo Queen. Oh, what a coincidence. I know. Did you do that on purpose? Yes, I did. Oh. Uh-huh. So what I did is I took some... I make simple syrup, but instead of simple syrup, I use stevia instead of sugar. Thank you, because I don't want diabetes. Yeah, me neither, yeah. because the recipe was like one cup of water and one cup of sugar. I was That's like... That's like way too much fucking sugar. Hi, I'm going to die. Yeah. Um, so I did stevia instead, and you boil that with a little bit of sage. Oh. And then after it comes to a boil, you let it steep for at least an hour. And then you Damn. use a little bit of that. You use about three quarters of a shot okay. of that. And then you use a shot and a half of rum. Okay. And then you muddle up some blackberries. Because I've just been like muddling berries a whole lot whenever yeah. we do that. Which yeah. kind of sounds dirty. It does sound a little bit, yeah. <laughs> what you do? If I called you up and like, what are you doing? You're like muddling berries. I'd be like, all right, I'll call you back. You're obviously <laughs> this seems pretty personal. Busy. <laughs> So I muddled up some berries mm. with that and then uh, topped it off with club soda and put a little bit of sage for garnish. All right. And I I don't, I, I like it. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's, it's not, not the best of our drinks, but. But it's not the worst either. Mm-mm. Well, yeah. I was trying to think what was the worst, but it doesn't matter. We don't have time. We got to talk about it. <laughs> First, let's do some Patreon shout outs. So starting with our uh, Empress supporters. Aaron, Alex, Amanda, Anastasia, Angelica, Annette, Ashley, Brianna, Brendan, Brett, Brooks, Candence, Caitlin, Charity, Krista, Claire, Deanna, Delania, Eleanor, Aaron, Genevieve, Grace, Isabel, Jackie, Jamie, Jared, Jazz, Jessica B., the other Jessica B and Jessica S. Jessica's love us. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Joel, Joshua, Kate, Kathy, Kaylee, Kelly, another Kelly. So Kelly F, Kelly H, and another Kelly H. So the Kellys love us too. Uh, yay, Kelly. That's so funny. I have two sisters and their names are Jessica and Kelly. Huh. Huh. Small world. Huh. Anyway. That's, that's some voodoo magic. That is some voodoo magic. <laughs> Kevin, Kiana. Christy, Kim, Lana, Lizzie, Maddie, Maria, Maureen, Natalie, Piper, Mittensley, Rachel, Robin, Samantha, Sarah, Sandra, Sophie, Spencer, Stephanie, in, Stephanie, O, Taylor, Tiffany, Tracy, and Yen. And shout out to our Queen Consort supporters. Abigail, Adelaide, Alexandra, Allison, Alyssa, Amanda, Anne, Ashley, Audrey, Barry, Brianna, Brianna, Caroline, Charlotte, Chelsea, (laughs) Christina, Claire, Cody, Danny, Danny, (laughs) Danielle. We have a lot of of similar names here. Yeah. (laughs) Daphne, Deanna, Diana, Emily, Emma, Erica, Georgia, Haley, Haley, Helene, Jackie, Jamie, Jara, Jessica, 
Jose, Julie, which we left out in our last episode. Sorry so about it, Julie. Special shout out to Julie. I love ya. <laughs> Carla, Kat, Kayla, Kaylee, Carrie, Kristen, Kristen, Christina, Kylie, Laura, Lauren, Lauren, Linda, Lindsay, Maya, Megan, Melanie, Melissa, Nicolette, Peggy, Raina, Rita, Sarah, Shannon, Shauna, Cheryl Lee, Taylor, Taylor, Terry, Toby, Valerie. Thanks, guys, and thanks to all of our listeners and all of our supporters at every level. We absolutely adore every one of you. Yes, much, much love. All right, let's get started. This Mar- one is so much fun. Marie Laveau was born at some point <laughs> in New Orleans in her grandmother's house. Um, much like a lot of queens we've covered, her birth wasn't properly documented. Yeah, some sources say, you know, I don't know, September 10th, 1801, and then others say sometime between 1794, and then we just don't fucking know. We don't know. There is a birth certificate, and I think the official one does say 1801, Mm -hmm. but there's reason to believe that maybe at some point in her life she wanted to, like, say that she was younger than she was. Uh, so she could have forged that. Yeah. But either way, we're just going to go with 1801, born in the French Quarter, New Orleans, Because that's, that's the that's, most common. Yeah. yeah. That's where we're going to go. So anyway, let's talk about her family right quick. So pretty much everything that we're going to tell you about Marie's life kind of is a big uh, maybe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so little of her life is documented and so much of it documented is actually has these little asterisks by it. Yeah. <laughs> which mean like, uh, we think this may have happened. Maybe. Not sure. But what we do know is that her great grandmother was brought to Louisiana as a slave. But then her grandmother was sold to a black woman who owned slaves and gave her a little bit more free range. And then by the time Marie was born... Um, Her grandmother and her mother were both freed women, and so Marie was the first of her family in the United States to be born as a free woman. Get it, girl. Yeah. That's awesome. Her mother's name was Marguerite, and um, yeah, Marguerite bought her own damn freedom and brought free children of color into this world. That is so amazing. Wait, but back up a second. Yeah. Slaves could buy their own freedom? I mean, not everywhere in the United States, but Louisiana at the time was <laughs> under Spanish rule, and they had been under French rule too. And they, the European, the Europeans had like slightly different ideas about how to treat them. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Spain and France are both... Catholic AF. Yes, very. Catholic to the max. (laughs) And so they believed in giving their slaves uh, Sundays off. So no slaving on Sundays? No slaving on Sundays. Um, And the slaves would take that time to find other jobs that they could do and actually get paid for. And this was accepted. Like, it... They were a little bit more laxed about it. Like, they... What, New Orleans is a little bit more laxed about stuff? Believe it or not. (laughs) Believe it or not. They were (laughs) laissez-faire. A little bit more (laughs) laissez-faire. And so slaves could then take their free time to go, you know, maybe go to somebody who didn't have slaves but needed help with something and be like, hey, did you need some manual labor today? I manual labor all the time. I'm really good at it, but you have to pay me. And those people... And so the slaves were able to accumulate their own independent money. Yeah, they had wealth. Like, yeah. And that's what they, they would use that wealth to purchase their freedom. Yeah. So Basically that's... being like, oh, master over there, how much would it cost to get you a new slave like me? They'd be like, oh, you know, 200 bucks. And they'd be like, here's 200 bucks. Yeah. Can I, can I go? Can I go? <laughs> I, can, I can go? I'm going to go now. Yeah. Yeah. So also New Orleans was a whole lot more laxed of a society, especially whenever it comes to the races intermingling. Mm-hmm. I found this, like, super fascinating. Really interesting. It went down, like, a huge rabbit hole on this. I mean, 
non-white people were still viewed as like second class citizens and white people were still the first class citizens because yeah. history is a bag of dicks mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it wasn't heard of for white people to do business with free blacks and free native americans at the time by the time marie was born louisiana had been purchased by america or maybe it was a couple of years later but but while she's coming up it's um it's the louisiana purchase has happened maybe you've heard of it it's also the name of an austin drag queen louisiana really? a purchase okay yes, yes. <laughs> um if you for those that didn't do american history in school and actually haven't heard of the louisiana purchase napoleon sold a fucking shit ton of land to america for like next to nothing yeah he was like hey here's like hundreds of thousands of acres of land for like, five dollars <laughs> like like it's obviously it includes louisiana but it goes all the way up to ohio or something yeah like it's a lot of fucking land and um yeah so anyway um we know her mom was a freed slave but who was her dad Uh, that's a very good question so short answer we don't really fucking know Mm -hmm. who is who Mm -hmm. is the daddy uh her mama listed on her birth certificate that the father was quote unquote unknown unknown there are two main theories um we do know for certain that her mother was the mistress of a wealthy white dude um, in my research, I saw the word concubine float around quite okay. a bit. So I'm thinking she was a little more, she wasn't just a side piece. Like, I mm. want to say it was almost more like, maybe like a common law marriage. Like, yeah. they lived together, um, and he provided for her, and perhaps, you know, it, maybe they were in love, maybe she was just like, hey, I need, I need money. But, um... Some people say that Mama's sugar daddy was this dude named Henri D'Arcentel. And most of her children were from Henri. But Hmm. then she had a brief affair with another free man of color named Charles Laveau. And if this free man of color, Charlie Laveau over here, was the baby daddy, he didn't stick around. Marie was not raised with like a father yeah, a around. father figure. Yeah. No, she didn't have one. No. So another theory, this is going to get a little tricky here. So there was a wealthy man who we believe was the mayor of New Orleans. I read that. Katie read that. So we think he was the mayor of New Orleans. And at one point was named Charles Laveau. Um, a lot of people who were enslaved, when they bought their freedom, they would end up taking over the name of their previous slave owner since they didn't really have their own last name. So it's really not that far-fetched. That there you know, was, you know, lots of Charles Laveau's running around. Yeah, because <laughs> Charles is a pretty common name. So, But it, I thought it was funny that there's two Charles Laveau's. Yeah. <laughs> Which Charles is it? Yeah. Um, so anyway, this theory is that Marguerite was actually the mistress of a wealthy politician, Charles Laveau. But then she stepped out on him with a freed person of color. But that white Charles was like, hey, girl, it's fine. We all fuck up. Your baby can take my last name. It'll give her, you know, a good foot forward in life. Both are plausible. Um, I, You know, white people and not white people were not allowed to get married. So the, either one could be the baby. I kind of lean more towards the first one. Mm-hmm. The... the um, Freed person of color, Charles Laveau, was uh, the baby daddy. But then I'm like, well, why didn't they get married? But maybe also because Mama didn't want to throw away her her sugar daddy. Yeah, all that money yeah. that's coming in. Yeah, and also I did read somewhere that um, the Charles Laveau that's the freed man of color was actually engaged to a fairly wealthy family, like oh. engaged to a fair, fairly wealthy woman. And um, he didn't want to mess that up either. He didn't want to mess that up <laughs> either. So, um, yeah. So, it's it's murky yeah, for just, sure. To say the least. Yeah. So, her upbringing, we honestly don't really know that much about. We do know that she had very light, light skin. So, she would definitely be viewed as, quote unquote, not white. Yeah. But she was, um, I mean... We know that she was more, probably about half white, and then um, about a quarter black and a quarter Native American. Okay. So, um, she, yeah, like you said, she fell into the not 
white section. Yeah, and even but though her she, skin was like probably lighter than some white people's yeah, skin, it still didn't matter. It still, yeah, it wasn't about the color of your skin. It was about racism. Because racism <laughs> sucks. Yeah, so she most, most likely grew up in the house of her grandmother, Catherine Henry. And honestly, we really don't know anything about her childhood except that she was raised Catholic. Super Catholic. Yeah, very, very Catholic. Which goes against a lot of what people think when they think of her, because you think voodoo. Yeah, but her grandmother probably taught her about the old oral traditions of voodoo. Yeah. Uh, But she was raised super fucking Catholic. Mm -hmm. So some of you might be saying to yourselves, uh... Catholic? Qu'est-ce que c'est? The voodoo uh-huh. queen? Catholic? What are you talking about? Well, we'll go into this a little bit later, but, um, like, she was baptized in the Catholic Church and stuff like that, but there was a big community of um, people of color that had come from Haiti and Africa that they didn't view those religions as mutually exclusive. Yeah. You know, they complemented each other. Mm-hmm. So we'll go into it a little bit later. Um, so you said that she was baptized in the Catholic Church, which is a big deal. Yeah. Because she was the illegitimate child of someone. Yeah. So but that's, you know, something... Anywhere else in America or Europe at the time, an illegitimate child getting baptized um, would have been done secretly. Yeah. Quietly. Yeah. Like, let's, you know... Which oh, is, I, I find so fucked up. It? So it's not the kid's fault and if right? and if he's going to be raised to if they're going to be raised to believe that if they're not baptized they're going to hell and like sorry we can't baptize you because your parents weren't married and you're like what well, do well, you get, really how? expect them to be christian at that yeah. point <laughs> but new orleans had a different there was this one priest um who i didn't write his name down but he and marie he's the one that baptized marie and i believe he's the one that married marie also mm-hmm. um was just very like no, bring me your babies. Yeah. I'm going to baptize all these babies. He kind of like took her under his wing. Yeah, and, and he baptized. He did not care if they were, their parents were married, if their parents were not married, if they were white, if they were not white. Like, he did. He was like, I'm going to, I'm bringing you all into the kingdom of heaven, my babies. <laughs> we're going to eat gumbo. It's going to be great. I like that. Yeah. I like that. I like that. <laughs> So, her education, dot, 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 question mark. <laughs> that is a very good way to describe her education, actually. <laughs> dot, 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 question mark. Yeah. Unlike many of the women we've covered, Marie's education was super lacking. It's believed she never learned how to read or write. So, her education was more practical. It was more worldly knowledge, like, you know, how to run a house. How Here's to, how to wash dishes. Here's how to do laundry. Here's yeah. how to budget for stuff that you need in the house. Yeah. Here, this is what you need to do to raise a child. However, she did have lots of Bible studies. So yes. She did know a lot about Jesus. Yes. I'm sure she knew her prayers backwards, forwards, upside down. She probably learned stuff like midwifery. Um, midwifery. Midwifery. Um... <laughs> And it's also, at this time growing up, she probably started to learn about, like, herbalists. Like, Mm -hmm. um, which means, you know, back then, doctors were like, oh, you've got a swollen ankle. It's because there's so much blood in there. Let's cut it open and bleed you. (laughs) Whereas now, and, like, so people that studied, um, like, herbal, medicinal, stuff like that back then would be like, no, 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 we need to put some ice on it to bring down the swelling. <laughs> Nowadays, we're like, well, duh. duh, that's what you do when you have a swollen ankle. Back then, it wasn't co- doctors who went to med school just wanted to put leeches on you or whatever yeah. <laughs> for everything. So, you know, and the poor, not white people couldn't necessarily afford doctors. No. So they would take it into their own hands, but... They were on the right path with like, yeah, they, let's find things in nature. I bet if you eat some of this whatever and we put this on it, it's going to be better for you than leeches slicing and your snakes leg open. and cutting you open and bleeding you. So, um, yeah, it's believed that she started to pick up these kind of things from her grandmother while she was being raised. So no formal education, practical education. Street smart. Street smarts. Learned a lot about God. And then some. <laughs> and she 
also probably learned a lot about this time about hairdressing. Yeah, which might become important later. Yeah, Grandma probably told her, look, you need to have, like, a skill set just in case being, you know, Miss Housewife, Miss... Doesn't pan out for you. Not everybody's gonna get a rich sugar daddy like your mama. (laughs) God, I wish. Where's the website to sign up for that? Right? Um, So... What we talked about a little bit earlier is what did she look like? We really... I mean, we're guessing with the light skin thing. <laughs> yeah. The famous portrait that you're thinking of is not her. That's um, either A, a portrait of her daughter, or B, just like completely artist rendering. Like artist, yeah. like artistic, like what do I imagine she looked like? We know she did wear her hair in a turban. People say she was beautiful. People say she was captivating. But, I mean, of course they do. If you're a revered and such popular figure in culture, people are going to say those things. Yeah, right? So, in 1819, Marie gets married at the ripe old age of 18. If we're following the 1801 birthday. Yes, she could have lied about her birthday because she wanted to be younger. Yes. So, there's that. So she married a guy named Jacques Perry. Jack Paris. <laughs> the Frenchest name. Like, I just, the first time I read that, just immediately I think of, like, a mime with a baguette <laughs> and a bottle of wine. Because like, Katie just envisions bottles of wine. Jack Paris. <laughs> Jacques, Jacques Perry. Perry. <laughs> So what do we know about Jacques Perry? Um, he was also a mixed race, uh, free person of color who had fled the slave uprising in Haiti. Oh my God! I went down <laughs> the deepest rabbit hole about the Haitian Revolution. Can I tell tell you like the summary of it, just real quick? Cliff notes. Cliff notes. Okay, so it lasted from 1791 to 1804. Haiti at the time was called Saint Domingo or Saint Dominique. Um, it was under French rule. Y'all, it's the biggest slave revolt since the Spartacus Revolution. Damn. Back in like ancient Rome, except the Spartacus Revolution famously ended with everybody getting crucified. Um, <laughs> so this one had a much happier ending. Well, for the slaves. Yes, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> um, please follow me down this rabbit hole for just a second. I promise we'll be right back to Marie. Um, so H- Haiti was the French territory that made a shit ton of sugar. Like half of the world's sugar supply came from Haiti. The slave owners did not follow this uh, Louisiana idea of, hey, be nice to your slaves. Um, They treated their slaves like fucking shit. And that's, I I feel like that's very understated too. Yes. No, they looked at it like, okay, working these slaves to death and buying replacement slaves is cheaper than feeding these slaves a decent amount and, you know, getting medical care for them when they hurt themselves or et cetera, et cetera. No, no, no. We'll just buy a new one. Yeah. So on this island, the non-slaves, which were made up of wealthy European, middle-class French people and freed people of color, they numbered less than 100,000 people. But the enslaved people numbered around 400,000 people. (laughs) So, Molly, you in danger, girl. (laughs) Yada, yada, yada. Big ol' revolution that resulting in the fucking slaughter of so many white and mixed-race people. And it's believed that Jack, uh, Jack Paris, got the fuck out of Haiti during the revolution, which, if you were a non-enslaved person... Get the hell out. Why wouldn't you? Like... I don't know his circumstance. No one knows his circumstance at all there in Haiti, but we know they ended up in New Orleans by 1819, but probably a couple of years before, because Marie's first child was born in like 1817. Oh, Oh. so they're getting married, y'all. So they're married in August 1819 at St. Louis Cathedral, which if you've ever been to New Orleans, you've seen it. It's the big cathedral. Yeah. It's the the big one. (laughs) the, The one that everybody knows. It's that one. Yeah. She did have a dowry in the form of a plot of land to build a house on, which is really cool. Yeah. Not sure who paid it, but most sources say it was Charles Laveau that paid it. Which Charles Laveau? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would go with the the white politician Charles Laveau. But if they even had any association with him. Yeah. They may have not actually had any association with this man whatsoever. Yeah, so this is... 
big old question mark. Yeah. But we believe the two of them, Jack and Marie, had two daughters. One of which was born before the wedding. Ooh, scandal, scandal. Shotgun wedding. Uh, except it's New Orleans and no, no one, one actually fucking cares. Really cared. <laughs> but it's likely both daughters died due to yellow fever, which was running rampant. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, my God. So bad. And, yeah. So that's a bummer. And then, we don't know. Hubby just fucking disappears. Honestly, <laughs> I... I believe, I believe what happened to him is he got yellow fever when his kids got yellow fever and Uh everybody just died. Um, And like so many people in Louisiana for like a good like 70 years, people were dying of yellow fever by the dozens each day. So. Not, not too hard to believe if he died from yellow fever. That, and that like he wasn't recorded dying because like they just buried a bunch of people in a mass grave that day yeah you know the theory that i kind of subscribe to is that like after his kids died he like fucked the fuck out of there and went to haiti again the reason i think so is because i feel like after losing two of your children and then being like i really don't have anything that's tying me here Mm -hmm. and all of these people are dying of yellow fever and being sick i should just leave And I think that's what happened. But then there's this last theory of what happened, which is the one that probably stuck. (laughs) Yeah, the one that, like, the first thing that really starts to build Marie's um, story of being, like, the black magic and et cetera, is that she um, just, like, voodooed him to death. (laughs) That That she killed Jack Paris. Like, it's... It... Ugh. No... I don't believe that for a second. Me neither. I mean, there's no public record of death. So, I mean, theoretically, she could have killed him and no one, and like buried the body in a mass grave and no one would have ever been the wiser. It just, from what, I feel like I've gotten to know Marie a little bit through researching her and it just doesn't seem her style. No, it doesn't. And I don't, I mean, there's really no reason for her to kill him. Not that whenever you kill somebody in a voodoo ritual or whatever, that there's a reason behind it. Yeah. But I just don't see there being... Also, I don't think they really usually killed people in voodoo rituals. No, I know. And so it was like, why... There's no motive for her to do that. The only reason that I think that she may have killed him is if he was about to leave her. And she got pissed off and like rage. But it just just doesn't seem her... Mm -mm. It doesn't... She was always a kind, actually very kind-hearted woman, too. Like, she was not what people painted her as. I think he most likely died. Um, yeah. I I think we both subscribe to that she definitely did not kill him. Yeah, I think he ran off. You think he died. Though, with the theory with him running off, because, like, she knew people were saying that, like, she killed her husband. And she could have been like, hey, everybody that'll listen for the rest of my life. I did not kill him. He did this, that, or the other. She never did that. And so maybe he left her... And out of spite, she wanted to th- everyone to think she killed him. Oh. You know, because she never, she was like, I mean, you can think what you want to think, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to set the record straight. So that's the only reason I'm like, well, maybe he didn't die. Maybe he did run off and she wanted everybody to think she killed him because <coughs> that's what happens when you fuck with me or whatever. Yeah, it adds to the allure of being the queen of voodoo. But right after that, and for the rest of her life in polite society, she was referred to as the Widow Paris. Yes. So, um, Okay. So let's get into the voodoo. Yeah, let's get into that ooky spooky. Because Because that's what she kind of started to become known for after Hubby One bounced. So like we were just saying, after Hubby One (laughs) bouncing, that kind of started putting out those negative PR moments of her being involved with voodoo. So first of all, if all you know about voodoo is what you've learned from American Horror Story Coven... um, girl you got it wrong (laughs) you need to forget everything you know about voodoo then because that's not that is some made up bullshit yes so firstly voodoo has so many similarities to catholicism especially new orleans voodoo um it's monotheistic and it has all these other deities that are so similar to what we know with catholics call saints Mm -hmm. you know Um, So when these slaves were brought over from Africa and Haiti, they were told to become Catholic or be beaten or killed. (laughs) So they're like, "Uh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, let's see. I I think I can work with this. Yeah. 
And so now many of the saints and voodoo deities are acting like these same things. So yeah. the, these deities in voodoo are, they're like, well, there's a Catholic saint for that. So when we're praying to that Catholic saint, we can secretly be talking about this voodoo god over for here. For instance, uh, is it Legba? That's Papa the... Legba, that's St. Peter. Yeah, they're the exact same. Th- I mean, I'm sure there's some slight differences, but they're both the gatekeeper, right? Yes. Right, that's what St. Peter does, right? Yes, like, he yes. Lets you he in keeps the, the gates, gates or not. Of yeah. Heaven. Yes. yeah. And <clears throat> so they, they have very similar takes on religion. Now, there are some rituals in voodoo that they really don't do in Catholicism. Like, um, they'll have these rituals and they'll call on the spirits to ride a voodoo priest or priestess. Which sounds really dirty. Yes, but basically what it means is like um, the... I don't want to say possesses the person, yeah. but that's the best way to describe it. Like, the spirit possesses that person. So, like, let's say it's Papa Legbucks, we've already mentioned him, is riding a voodoo priestess. Well, now that he is there and he can talk to both the physical world and the spiritual world, yes. it's a way for them to communicate with their ancestors. It's It's really interesting, and while... A bunch of Christians might look at it and be like, no, that's devil work. That's weird because they don't do that in Catholicism. I don't see how that's a whole lot different than evangelical Christian religions that speak in tongues. Okay, that's a fair assessment because they're... They have the Holy Spirit in them. Yeah. And so it's kind of so a I, form of possession. Yeah. I can see how so, you could and say it's that. Not, and it's not meant to be something evil. Um, yeah. So, again, that's another thing that Westerners took and ran with their imaginations, being like, they're, they have a possessed by a spirit and they're talking about death. But sometime after Jack's death, she started gaining a reputation. And I think... I think that she basically called herself the Widow Paris because she could hear people whispering about how she killed her husband and how she practiced voodoo and he just randomly disappears. So I think she called herself this as a way to be like a middle finger to these people being like, I hear what you're saying about me. I'm not going to acknowledge it. Yeah. But bitch, I might. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. okay. So she's a widow now, <laughs> and she needs to start making her own money. So she starts doing hair, honey. Which, uh, from American Horror Story Coven, that's like the only thing they got accurate yeah, they about got accurate. Marie uh, Laveau. She did hair. And she was really fucking good at it. Mm-hmm. Like, she had all of the wealthy socialites, politicians, all that rich white clientele was just pouring in her doors. Yeah, so these wives of judges and senators would come to see her and um, the people that worked for her. And what do you do when you and your girlfriends get together and go to the salon and the salon pops open a bottle of champagne and oh you don't have anything God. else to do that day? You start gossiping. Oh, hell yeah. And Marie was here for it. Because she got to hear about all of the dirty little secrets of people. I also read that what she did was um, whenever she... The the white clientele's slaves or the people that work for them, she would use them and talk to them and be like, Hey, tell your master that I did this really cool thing for you the other day that... I put a hex on one of your enemies, and here's $20. Yeah. And they'd be like, oh, she put a hex on my enemy. Well, another thing that I thought was really interesting in this is that um, the other day I was watching Killing Eve, and I swear this has a point. (laughs) And there's like an episode where there's a killer, and they're like killing in plain sight, and Sandra Oh, who's um, an Asian actress, so I think it's a woman of color that's the killer because... She's killed, like, people aren't noticing her. And then, like, a white man interrupts her and is like, well, why would you think that? That's stupid, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, the mere fact that you interrupted me to ask your question Ooh. proves my point. Ooh. And so I feel like that ties here because, like, these people of high society are gossiping and they don't think that the people of color around them are listening. Are, like, they're like, oh, who are they going to tell? What are they going to, or, like, doesn't even notice they're there, you know, because they're, they have, they're not trained they haven't trained their brain that way you know 
Um, they've trained their brains to think that people of color are too dumb to do anything with this information or whatever. But not Marie. But they've got, but not Marie. <laughs> her and her people are keeping, they're like, I don't know if it's ever going to be important to know that this woman that just came in is sleeping with that senator. But I'm going to file it away just in case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so she just really, she's like, she's kind of like Varys in Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All her whispers, all her little birds mm-hmm. working for her. Mm-hmm. So there's all these whispers around, you know, about her floating around this polite society. You know, the Widow Paris does amazing hair, which ends up turning into the Widow Paris knows some stuff. And, you know, she did know about the sister sleeping with the judge. Yeah. She did know about all that information that she just filed away while listening to drunk ladies with their hair getting did. Yeah. And then word got out, or she started letting it out, <laughs> that the widow pairs practice voodoo. And these white people don't understand that. They just think it's spells and black magic. So now it's like you go and get your hair cut. And while you're there, you get a spell from the widow Paris. And she starts making, like, actual money. She's making coin. Yeah. And, like, serious coin. But then, alas, l'amour strikes again. <laughs> yes. She meets a man, and this time it sticks. Yeah, and it's another really French name. Um, Louis-Christophe Dominique de Glapillon. Um, we're going to call him Chris. <laughs> Are you okay with just calling him Chris? Yeah, I'm okay. That's a very pretentious name. Yes. So we don't know a whole, whole lot about Chris or their relationship, but we do know that he was a white dude, and we think he came from a fairly rich family. And we know they were together for 30 years. So even though they couldn't legally get married, this was 100% the love of her life. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, 100%. she was with... 100%. Yeah, 30 years of your life. Yeah. It, it wasn't no just fling. Yeah. You know. All we really know about him is that he was born in New Orleans. Um, He was a veteran and fought in the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. So I think it's pretty safe to assume that he was at least a few years older than Marie, since she would have been, you know, only about 13 or 14 at the time, if we go by the 1801 definition. And Um, everyone seems to to agree that um, his family is descendants from the French um, aristocracy. Though we don't really think he was, like, rich bitch. Yeah, but we also, like, who knows, it's also thought that, like, his family may have cut him off from their inheritance whenever he took up with a black woman. Oh, racism. Yeah, super cool, super cool. So soon after they got together, he bought her grandmother's house um, so that she, like, because the grandmother had passed away and it was a little dispute, like, who was gonna, who was it gonna go to? So he stepped in and bought it. And they lived together there for the rest of Chris's life. Um, Fun myth about this house. The legend goes that there was a wealthy white man whose son was on trial for murder. And the wealthy white dude came to Marie and was like, hey, if you could do that voodoo that you do and get my son off for this crime. (laughs) That voodoo that you do. I'll give you whatever you want. And so she did the voodoo that you do and (laughs) got the son off for the crime. And... Then she was like, well, I want a house. And so the rich white guy was like, here, let me buy you this house. And that's how she got her house. So that's a big load of bullshit, obviously, because this is the house she was born in. This is the house that she was raised in by her grandmother. No. And it almost kind of pisses me off a little bit. I know. To implicate that some strong like a strong family of independent free women couldn't have just possibly bought a house themselves I know, right that they had to have um they had to like work voodoo to, to like, get the house that they grew up in yeah like you get that's a load of it's bullshit. a it's a fun myth story and again i think Marie probably heard the story in her life and just was like... She wasn't mad at it. She was like, sure. (laughs) (laughs) If y'all want to give me all this power in these stories, sure. This is cool. But no, it was was not the house that Voodoo bought. It was the house that hard work, determination, and getting yourself free from slavery bought. Work it, bitch. Yes. But I mean, this whole house myth goes to show you that... That she's building herself a reputation yeah. among these people. Totally. Because rich people were coming to her to ask for spiritual guidance, ask to use her, quote unquote, powers to tell them what they need to know. Mm-hmm. 
And of course, she'd take their money and be like, yes, your husband is sleeping with your sister. Um, they were boating last weekend. The spirits have spoken. Give me your money. Yep. And that's pretty much exactly But really, she knew that her husband was sleeping with her sister because her the sister, sister was in the salon the other day yeah. and was talking about how she slept with her sister's exactly. husband. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, around this time, she starts having babies on babies on babies on babies. All the babies. We don't really know the, the official count. It was anywhere it, from 7 to 15. 7 to 15. <laughs> That's a big gap. Uh, I'm... So, like, um, I'm going to say the number was probably, in reality, closer to the 7 number. Yeah. But, again, since their children were illegitimate, they weren't having, you know, being documented in newspapers. You know, there's, like, yeah. no... And Marie couldn't read and write, so it's not like she kept diary or, like, wrote letters or anything. Um, And it's also thought, you know, with the higher number 15, well, maybe she had a few kids and those kids had grandchildren that also lived in the house. That kind of just fell under the the umbrella. umbrella. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Under her umbrella. Ella, (laughs) Ella. Um, Some of this confusion also might come from that... Marie named all her daughters Marie. Because uh, just like all of her other queens, they are not creative with names. Well, it made me think of Marie Antoinette because she was, um, I think all of her sisters were Marie. And then they'd go by their middle name. Their middle name, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's just a Catholic Mother yeah, Mary. Yeah, thing. makes sense. So sadly, however, pretty much all of her children but two died in childhood. This it's, is fucking yellow fever. It's no joke. No and joke. also, I just... Even though they were doing okay for themselves, they still, you know, for what we consider sanitary now, it's not what they considered sanitary then. So people just, children with not fully formed immune systems were just susceptible. Yeah. So if she had had seven children and only two of them survived childhood, while that was a higher morality, more... A higher death count. Yeah, Yeah, mortality is what I was trying to go for. That was a higher mortality count than average back then, that wouldn't have been unheard of. Especially during that time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, totally. Because between 1817 and 1907, over 41,000 people died in New Orleans alone. Yeah. But due to the poor record keeping, we don't really know when the kids died, what happened, so yeah. nobody really cared. But her two children that did survive were both named Marie, because that's not confusing at all. Not at all. One was Marie Helois, and the other was Marie Philomene. Philomene. Yep. Marie. Uh, going for it. All the Maries. Maries and Maries and Maries. Um, yeah, so... I read a lot that um, some of these stories about Marie uh, Laveau may be just stories of one of her daughters. Yes, um, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. But yeah, one of her daughters, um, when her mom retired... Just was like, well, I'm Marie Laveau now then. And her mom was like, all right, baby, you do you. You do you. And, um, yeah, so. Her notoriety, Marie Laveau, is just like growing and growing and growing. She's holding voodoo ceremonies every week. And while plenty of people of color held these voodoo ceremonies all over New Orleans, Marie's were fucking famous. And it wasn't just people of color that would come to them like most of the other ones would. It was like the to-do thing if you were someone yeah. in New Orleans society. Well, um, this predates it a little bit, but New Orleans is also just different than the rest of the country. And um, like when, when Lincoln was shot, his wife would hold seances all the time mm-hmm. um, because spiritualism and the occult... In like the late like the eighteen sixties eighteen seventies was so popular amongst like the upper class Americans, mm-hmm. so it wouldn't surprise me if this is just a precursor to that. So the upper class people in New Orleans just being so curious about like I bet I bet you're one hundred percent right about that about the occult and stuff, and they have it in they they're just curious about like what other religions are doing and stuff. <laughs> So, so the white people were, it was almost like a social thing. Like, 
you haven't been to one of Marie Laveau's voodoo ceremonies, like because it was like a show in and of itself. Yeah, like, yeah. It's like, what are, do you want to go to the theater or do you want to go see to one of Marie Laveau's uh, um, parties? That would be a difficult question if you asked me today. Yeah. I would probably be like Marie Laveau ceremonies, even though I'm a totally. fan of the theater. So these rich white people were attending these voodoo ceremonies too, and um, on one hand, I'm like, cool. I think it's cool that Marie was like probably taking these people's monies while she money while she, they were there she's making money off of it um because she's selling them spells or whatever but i also think it's kind of cool that she was so accepting mm-hmm. cuz i bet there were some white people that attended or some non-white people that weren't raised with voodoo at all attending that were just trying to understand the culture yeah so i think it's cool that she um didn't she never turned anybody away yeah and it was really cool so let's talk about this culture let's talk about these voodoo ceremonies yeah because voodoo was brought over from africa and haiti by the slaves uh, specifically west africa Mm -hmm. um the interesting about thing about voodoo is that there's no formal book yeah like with um christianity there's the bible with Judaism, there's the Torah. With, With Islam, there's the Quran. Yeah, these people couldn't read and write. Yeah, and this is the, the, those books set as like a specific set of guidelines on how to act, how to be. This yeah. is how you achieve. And the, religion. these are the stories we believe. These are the people, the you know, the saints that we believe in. The da da da. da. And but since these people didn't have it written down, and it was all oral tradition. It would vary a little bit from community to community. And kind of like what we were talking about, how there's like uh, New Orleans voodoo. There's also Haitian voodoo. There's also West African voodoo. There's there's different types of voodoo because it's all passed down orally. So it changes a little bit over the years. Here and there. They have the same core beliefs, but they have little subtle differences between the two. Because they didn't have the book. (laughs) The the book. (laughs) So the slaves in New Orleans... They were given a space to meet and socialize, and subsequently that turned into a place where they could practice voodoo once a week. So long as they were, like, you know, super duper Catholic at every other time of the week. It was this really public spot called um, Congo Square. Um, When we were in New Orleans Mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, we did a voodoo tour, and we spent a lot of the time in Congo Square, which is now in St. Louis Park. Not St. Louis Park, uh, Louis Armstrong Park. Yeah, and didn't somebody, like, leave, like, rum and a cigar for Papa Lipa? Yeah, there was... um, it was it was so interesting because they didn't just come to Congo Square to do voodoo stuff. It was also to um, set up a market to yep. try to sell their stuff, you know. Um, and maybe if there was a guy you like, but he worked at another house, this was the only time you got to see him, you know, stuff like that. But they would also practice voodoo there. And yeah, there was this tree there that was a thousand years old or something like yeah, that. And the, our tour guide, our tour guide, was like. Um, this tree is so old, people come and leave offerings here. And sure enough, there was a little airplane size rum there. Uh huh, with a cigar. Yeah, for Papa Legba. Yep, it was so cool. And um, Congo Square also has this really cool, the, what would you call that? Like the statue thing that was there? Yeah. Of um, the monument? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it was a monument. It, it was um, depicting um, the slaves like dancing yeah. in a circle so at the, cool. and it was just. I just thought it was really, really interesting. If you yeah, ever, it was let's like, give them a shout out because I forgot to go give them a, a a review online. If you're in New Orleans, the company's called Tour by Foot. They do it's free to do their tours. You just tip the tour guide afterwards. But tip the tour guide afterwards, definitely. <laughs> and our tour guide was. I've done this tour twice now. The first time I did it um, was oh man, it was before I was married. So. Five, at least <laughs> five, four or five years ago, and the tour guide was a guy whose religion was voodoo still. Um, and then this time we had a, a white woman who wasn't voodoo, but she, she obviously she, she was, was Wicca. Wicca, but she had a lot of she'd been to like she was very like familiar with the culture yeah. and like had been to some ceremonies and stuff before, and it was. So interesting, and I'm so glad that it was such a packed tour because it did so much to, like, tell people, hey, you think you know anything about voodoo, but all you've seen are, like, this black magic in movies and shit. Yep. That's not it. 
all. <laughs> yeah. That's not the- at all what this religion is. And um, sorry that I, I'll get off my soapbox now. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk about <laughs> about the tour that we went on <laughs> in, in New Orleans. But it was so interesting. Yeah. And so, like, it was also a place where Congo Square where not only did, you know, slaves get to kind of, like, let loose and be, you know, some symbiont- symbionts of being free. And having fun. And it was, like, the only time fun. they got to have fun. But the white people felt comfortable with that because they would they would intermingle in Congo Square, too. It was actually mm-hmm. an interracial it was such a, sort of a, it thing. It was such a public spot. Yeah. That, that they were like, we can keep an eye on them. Exactly. So yeah, Marie would often come to Congo Square and conduct voodoo rituals and celebrations here. And I can just hear the white dudes now being like, wait, is that my wife's hairdresser? (laughs) (laughs) What's happening? (laughs) What what is this? And basically out in the middle of Congo Square, these ceremonies would take place to connect with the spiritual world. Um, Voodoo has this concept that when you die, there are three parts of your soul. One part goes back to God. One part goes to be with your ancestors who've passed, and the other third spirit is said to stay around and look over everybody else that's remaining there. And also, if we're if you are practicing voodoo, but it's not uh, New Orleans voodoo, we specifically only researched that. If we are getting this wrong, do tell us. Tell us what yeah, you practice. We're very interested in that. Um, but we're this going is, down a whole another rabbit hole with the Patreon episode. Yeah, on that. but this is just what we learned from talking to people who in New Orleans. Exactly. Yeah. So one person or sometimes multiple people would like open themselves to be you know ridden by these deities. Yeah, we kind of touched on that earlier. And yeah. yeah, they would speak to the spirits. So, many people in white society saw these ceremonies and were like, curious, very curious. Very curious. So, they'd attend the private ones that Marie would host at her home. Or, you know, at someone else's home that all the races could attend. Mm-hmm. And I did read that these, uh, Marie's especially, incorporated a lot of cat- Catholic imagery. The ones that she would do where um, more of the white people would come, yeah, I think she specifically wanted to put familiar things around like the virgin mary holy water yeah like certain things just like to that. make them not be so freaked out yeah <laughs> <laughs> and marie just developed like this reputation both good and bad as the woman that you would go to to make anything happen in your life yeah they say that she had a huge sa- snake named Zombie that she'd bring out, which I think is pretty rad. <laughs> but I don't know how true it is. Like, I don't know if people kept snakes as pets. Back then. Back then. We have a Patreon listener that actually has a pet snake. Yeah, and she's gorgeous. Emma. Shout out to Emma. <laughs> Shout out to Delania's snake, Emma. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, um, we don't. I don't think she actually had the pet snake. I think that was just, like, part of the... Because that was such a creepy thing to think, like, what is the creepiest pet she could have? She has a snake. And it's named Zombie! The symbol of the devil. Yeah. Basically. Um, but so yeah. Not only is she taking some money on the side for these ceremonies that she's having at her house, she's also making money as an herbalist. So, as we mentioned earlier... She may have learned a lot about these medicinal herbs as a child. So people are coming up to her being like, I've got a rash on my arm and uh, my doctor wants to bleed me. So I thought maybe I should have come to see you first. And she'd be like, oh no, honey, let me mash up these herbs. Let me make them into like a thing for you to put on your arm. And before you go see that doctor again, give it a couple of days. Um, Don't let him cut you right now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so um, doctors back then, m- one of my favorite memes ever is like an old-timey doctor listening to a guy's heart, and it was like, being an old-timey doctor would be rad. It'd be like, you got ghosts in your blood, do some cocaine about it. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. So Marie is making money, y'all. She's doing these secret voodoo spells for rich dumbasses that really just all gossip too much. Um, and she's an herbalist healing people with her um, magical... Mad? Science. Science. Was her science? Yeah. yeah. She's selling these charms, like, they call them gree-gree bags. 
And you carry them around with you. I bought a Grigri bag. I bought two, and I actually bought another one online. <laughs> um, I got them from Voodoo Authentica online. Yeah. Like, that's where we went. Yeah. They have an online Vo- store. Voodoo so. Authentica is where I got my fortune told. So, yeah, uh, if you ever want a Grigri bag. And what they're, like, the one, for instance, the one I bought, I have no idea what's in it, but it's, like, a light blue color, and it's got a little um, peace sign charm wrapped around the top of the bag. Oh. We're not talking like big old bags, like backpack size. They're like little, little like two or three inch high little sacks. Yeah. And you're supposed to, the one I bought was supposed to be for peace. Yeah. So whenever you're feeling like turmoil in your life, you take out the Grigri bag and carry it around with you. Exactly. Yeah. I think our, um, our tour guide on the Voodoo tour described it best. She's like, it kind of resembles uh, an amulet from like Catholicism where you, mm. it's like used as protection and oh. it's something that you have next to you to like protect you from all the evil spirits and everything like that. So yeah. that's sort of a thingy. But no, she's her. making all this money, so she's really rich, right? Oh. Oh. <laughs> I don't think either her or Chris were particularly good with money. Yeah, and from Marie's standpoint at least, I think the reason she wasn't good with money is that she just had such a big charitable heart. Yeah. She gave to people that were homeless or people that were struggling or what I thought was cool is she was there for the wrongfully convicted. She was, she had such a soft spot in her heart for people in prison that either um, were wrongly convicted, A, or B, like people that maybe were there for convictions that were real but had like not... Wanted to rehabilitate, but the system wasn't built that way at that time. Yeah, it still isn't built that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but back then, they weren't pretending it was. No, <laughs> like, exactly. So she would spend money to try to help these people get a second chance, or if there was no second chance for them, um, live the most comfortable life they could that was left in prison. Yeah, you know? and unfortunately, some people are assholes, and they take advantage of people like who that. are charitable, mm-hmm. and they take their money and run yeah, with it. Yeah, maybe some of these people should have stayed in jail. Yeah. Um, she but- also had a huge spot in her heart for orphans mm-hmm. and homeless people. So she would let, like, if she had a space for someone to sleep in that wasn't being taken and there was a child sleeping on the streets. Honey baby, why don't you come back to my place? Yeah. I got a I got a bed for you. I got a spot for you. I got you know and um I think you're right. I think people did take advantage of that. I think not as much as would have if she didn't have this reputation as a scary voodoo yeah, queen. Yeah, no, you're right. I think if she had a good reputation of being this charitable woman, she they probably would have taken more advantage of her. Yeah. But the fact that she's this voodoo queen, some people are like, I don't know if I really want to... I'm not going to fuck with her. Yeah, because she might fucking kill me. But um, um don't get it twisted. <laughs> don't. She was not... A Harriet Tubman of her time or anything. No, 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 no. She She was very much of the time that she was born into. Um, Marie herself owned slaves. Yes. That was not very uncommon for a Mm -mm. free person to own slaves. Because that was just what society did. Yeah. Now, she didn't own a plantation, so she didn't have, like, dozens of slaves. She probably had, like... Maybe Two or a, three yeah, in maybe the a house couple. at a time. It wasn't like she had that I want to say, I can't remember the exact number. I want to say that I read um, that in her lifetime she had a total of 15 slaves. So she'd have like two or three here for 10 years, two or three here for 10 years, you know? Uh, I mean, it doesn't make it right. No. It doesn't make it good because one and slave she, is one too many. <laughs> one thing that I heard that really surprised me because she is does seem to have this soft spot for children is well maybe 15 wouldn't be considered a child back then but she um there was a child that was born into her house like as a slave mm-hmm. and at 15 she sold this girl like sold her I don't, know I don't know the details like I don't know like maybe she just sold her to the people next door or maybe she checked it but but it just seemed so out of character based on everything else but so that just goes to show you it was such a different time back then. Yeah, it was. That us was... in our modern days cannot... Like, when I first learned that there were black people that owned slaves, I was like, Boo? You know, like, <laughs> what? Yeah, <laughs> so it was just... A completely it was just, different time. Yeah, that was just normal to them. So, like we mentioned earlier, she was super interested in mixing the races and intermingling, but she was also a product of her time. I feel like 
with the shit her reputation has gone through that if there were any indication that she was cruel to her slaves it would have it would come it out it would have made it but out but since there's not a single story about her being mean to slaves i don't think she was a bad sl- like well they're all bad slave owners but like i don't yeah. think i don't think that she mistreated, mistreated. yeah cuz they had this thing in new orleans at the time called the code noir and it was about um how you're supposed to treat your slaves and it basically was like Hey, look, guys, these are humans, and God would probably be pretty pissed off if he knew you were being super mean to them. So, like, you know, only beat them if they did something really bad. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> and um, a lot of white society pretended, like, la, 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 I can't hear you. What? Come to our work. But, um, I, so, but I feel like if a person of color had been reported for breaking the code noir. They would have gotten in trouble. They would have gotten in trouble, and there's no... So anyway, she had slaves. She was probably pretty good to them, as good as you can be to somebody that you own. Let's move on. So (laughs) after about 30 years together, sadly, her hubby, well, her live-in husband, I guess you would say. I mean, he's not her husband. Common law marriage. I want to call him... Domestic I want to call him her husband. Because he would have been if he could have been. Yeah, if it was allowed. And, you know, someone can, you know, might not be your husband on paper, but but is your husband in your heart. I feel like he was her husband in her heart. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. They were together for 30 fucking years. Yeah. We don't really know what he died of, but I mean, Marie is probably around 54 if we're subscribing to the 1801 birth. So he's probably in his 60s. Yeah, so maybe he just kind of... the 1800s. He just died of being old. Yeah. Just... Just, or yellow fever, or uh, yeah. a paper cut. Like we don't know exactly. We also don't know how she took it, but I'm gonna I mean, imagine not great. Yeah, thirty um, years of being with somebody. Obviously, this is like you are losing the love of your life. Yeah, and she. This was the love of, and her she life. has seen so much death in her her life. Uh, um, probably like seven kids, maybe more. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe her first husband. Um, I you know, just it. I'm sure at this point she was grief wasn't new to her, mm-hmm. but Jesus Christ, you've been he's been your confidant, he's been your husband for thirty years. I know, and again, we really don't know much about their relationship, but to be together, I have this image of them being in this very supportive, loving I, I, relationship. I, I have to assume that he must have been very supportive because not all white men of that time would have been like, yep, my wife's the voodoo queen. Yeah. You know? Like, so I think he was probably like, you get him, baby. Like, exactly. Like, like, I think he must have been You go, Glen Coco. Yes. <laughs> um, so that, that sucks. That's very sad. And it's sad, and I don't know, because again, so much of her, the stories about her life are lore, And so maybe somebody's just being overly romantic here. But it's said after he died, she got, um, like, her health, like, took a nosedive. And she never completely recovered. And I believe grief can do that to you. Oh, yeah, it can. It can negatively affect your health. Because she lived for decades longer. But they say that after he died, it was... She was just never the same. She was just never the same, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. But remember how I said they may have been bad with money? Oh, here's the receipts. <laughs> Chris was in debt. Like, mm-hmm. whoa. And I don't so- know what of. I have to imagine it must have been like... Because there's no... I feel like if he had been a big gambler mm-hmm. or a big, like, like buy it, taking women out on dates or anything like that, we would have heard about that. Mm-hmm. So it must have just been they were bad at managing the money maybe he was just as um generous as she was yeah maybe Maybe he was giving money to people too um but yeah so he they he died and she woke up in debt yeah and chris's family obviously refuses to help her out because racism uh, uh, part three this is like the third time we've mentioned racism bag of dicks (laughs) bag of dicks history (laughs) is a bag of dicks So, Marie nearly lost her grandmother's house, but luckily, a friend of Chris's was like, look, I'll buy the house, and you can just fucking live there. Yeah. And, And, uh, I mean, I'm sure Marie was probably, like, on one hand, feeling a little too proud to take charity like that, but on the other hand, 
Yes, please and thank you. I need a place to live. And, and at the same time, it's I feel like it's her grandmother's house. Yeah, it's her grandmother's house, and it's a little bit of karma coming back to her. Yeah. Because, I mean, she had been. Charitable. She deserved charity. Yeah, yeah absolutely. She, it was something where she had it coming for her. Um, so, this other thing that goes against the image and the lore that was built around Marie was this scary, wicked figure who was so powerful, but really, in actuality, she was just struggling to keep a roof over her head. I know, I know. Like, can you imagine how she's feeling at this point in her life? Like, the humiliation and just, like, the heartache of, like, love of my life has died and I'm having to rely on charity Mm -hmm. to keep a roof over my head. Around this time also, it was so fucked up, a local newspaper called her The notorious hag who reigns over the ignorant and superstitious as the queen of the voodoo. Fragile dick energy. Fragile dick energy turned up to 11. I know. It is so, like... and Take her when she's down. So even if you're like... I mean, she couldn't read the newspaper, but I'm sure somebody would have told her. And so, like, even if you're the most confident person in the world, do you know the feeling... I think everyone's had that time in your life where it's like when it rains it pours oh hell yeah and it's like bad things happen in threes so Mm -hmm. it's like your husband dies you lose your house and now people are slandering you in the newspaper when all that rule of three in life when all you've ever tried to do is like do good for your community Mm -hmm. like and maybe take some money for maybe take some money for some people that (laughs) gossip too much yeah (laughs) but no just like fragile dick energy but you know what she is resilient she is like I don't have time to sit here and feel sorry for myself. And she kept working and doing her thing and got back on her feet for the next couple of years. Like, get it, girl. Yeah, she recovers both financially and emotionally. But then in 1857, she's like, I I think maybe I'll retire. (laughs) Getting too old for this shit. (laughs) And she announces at a voodoo ceremony... That this is going to be her final performance. Which I can kinda, imagine, like, if... Uh, I would die if she was like, this is my final performance. I'd be like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Except she was kind of like Elton John, and but it wasn't really. Like, <laughs> or like Cher. Yeah. Her farewell, farewell part it keeps seven coming tour. Back. Yeah. But um, they say that that's when she passed the torch on to one of her daughters, who then was known as Marie Laveau too. And we really don't know which Marie it was that actually yeah. got the torch. It's just one of because I've Marie's. I've read I read so many things that said it was like I let's say I read ten articles on Marie Laveau. Five of them said it was uh, Marie Heloise, and five of them said it was Marie. <laughs> what was her name? <laughs> Phil- Philemon, Philemon, Marie P. And um, so it doesn't, it's not known, but it is said that whichever daughter took over for her is the one that looked exactly like her. Oh, uh, so kind of that. So, like, so like after she had retired and the other, and the daughter took over, people would be like, I saw Marie Laveau walking the streets and she looks exactly like she did 50 years ago. And it's like, oh, that's her daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so Marie's not honestly one of those that's just gonna sit idly by and not do anything. She kept doing some readings here and there, and she still made her gree gree bags from time to time. And she really, like we were talking about, developed this place in her heart for she dedicated incarcerated people. so much of her time going and seeing um, incarcerated people, and also I read specifically incarcerated women. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know maybe. She would do, like, spells for them and stuff like that. Just to, like... Even if it doesn't do anything, it gives people hope. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and So there is this... Around um, 1858 or so, there is this huge bout of yellow fever. I mean, it's always been bad. Yeah. But, like, it was specifically bad. And... And okay, so yellow fever is mosquito born. And if you've ever and this been, is New Orleans. And there's lots of swamps and mosquitoes. Lots of mosquitoes. Um, so this was not one of those diseases that um, oh, mainly poor, like dysentery. Mainly poor people got dysentery because mm. they had bad drinking water. No. Every walk of life went outside and got bit by mosquitoes. And it was contagious, and it, too. And it was you... also, once you had it, it was contagious. And so it was poor people, rich people, middle class people, color, people of color, white people. like Religious people. Not religious people. Like, yeah. it was everybody. And um, 
Like, the people of the town, like, the statesmen, like, the mayor and shit came to Marie and were like, we know that you are a gifted healer and herbalist. Um, we, can you come and um, do it for us? <laughs> like, everybody's dying. Plus. <laughs> Plus, give me your voodoo. And it's like, and it's just like. Plus, give me your voodoo. <laughs> uh, plus, voodoo and it's just plus. so annoying that just like a few years ago in the newspapers, they're being like, hag. And, and now that, that like everyone's dying, they're like, hi. <laughs> remember that stuff we said about you earlier? <laughs> LOL. No, I don't remember it. Do you remember it? Come on. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so she ended up going out. Like she did. Mm-hmm. She went out. And her daughters did too. And they were. They would spend days uh, like for a few months they'd go days and days and, and they days weren't, nursing the sick and they weren't like working voodoo they were putting hot rags on your head or cold rags on your head if it felt like you had a fever they were changing your sheets or whatever like it's they, not fucking magic they're, they're they were just tending to people that didn't have people to tend to them exactly people... and i'm sure there were people that were like work a spell and she'd be like roll her eyes and be like hocus pocus or whatever you know like <laughs> Just to make some money or whatever, but mainly she was just being a nurse. She was just taking care of people that needed it. And I just, I mean, for the people that talk shit on her, it's just like, but look what, she was so famous for being like such a big heart that her community came to her and was like, help us out. And she could have been like, I'm retired. And fuck you for saying all those bad things about me. And instead, she was just, like, without even a thought. She was like, no, I'm out there in the fields. I'm helping people. Who that... have a contagious disease, like... And so that was another thing. Since she and her daughters never caught it, they were like, oh, black magic, voodoo, whatever. Yeah. But the thing is, when you grow up around a contagious disease, because New because um, Yellow Fever predates Marie in New mm-hmm. Orleans... When you grow up with a contagious disease all around you all the time, and you have never died from it, your body has built up immunities. This is before vaccinations were mainstream, but still, your body had... That's basically what a vaccination is, you know? Your body has built up a little bit of immunity. It has a low dosage of that virus in it, so And so, it wasn't... I mean, it's lucky, because you could still catch it and you could still die, especially since she was an elderly person at this point. But um, she probably been around it her whole life that she had a strong immune system. Yeah, so it it wasn't magic that she wasn't dying. It's just this was not her first time nursing sick people. Exactly. Well, she had children that probably died from it. Yeah. So so, she probably built the immunity at that time. Maybe even like passing on the immunity through booby milk to her kids. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) But it just I just think that's something that. When you when people talk about Marie Laveau, you don't think of this person who just was so selfless. Exactly. Yeah. Nobody thinks of that. Yeah. Marie spent the rest of her life like providing care and helping people in her community and she pretty much lays low. Her daughter, like we said, took on Marie Laveau the second. She probably wasn't as nice as her. Marie Laveau the second heard the nasty rumors and went, "Oh, I'll show you, evil voodoo queen." Yeah, and leaned into it hard. So that's probably where all the bad reputation. I came. don't think all of it, but it didn't help. Yeah, exactly. She was pissed that everyone talked about her mama so badly for so long, and she was like. I'll she, show you. Yeah. I'll show you. Well, evil. I mean, if you saw your mom being such a good person to everybody and yeah. they all treat treat her like shit, you'd be like, okay, it's time. But to again, get... this is all lore. We don't yeah. know for sure. There's not enough information on her daughter for us to like research. Yeah. What she was actually like. But yeah. So Marie ended up passing away in 1881 at the age of 80, which, I mean, that there's some voodoo there if you're 80 years old back in that day. She died in the home she was born in. Um, she had her daughters and her grandchildren with her. Her funeral was, like, people couldn't all fit into the St. Louis Cathedral. That's so awesome. That's I know. so awesome. By all, probably a lot of people that she helped, too. Yeah. You know? It was a social event. Yeah, there were people of all colors, mm-hmm. all religions, mm-hmm. all races. They it were... was a strictly Catholic ceremony, though. Yeah. It was, there was no mention, even in her obituary, there was no mention of voodoo, um, which I think she would have been fine with. Yeah. I think, I think she, she probably expected that. 
you know? Yeah. And I bet there was also a voodoo celebration held quietly somewhere else for her life. <laughs> yeah, probably so. Um, the local New Orleans paper gave her a whole page for her obituary. And it sang her praises. It called her beautiful. It called her a community organizer. Mm-hmm. Like, it was none of that shit that anyone had ever said to her. Because, you know, most obituaries now and then are like, two sentences Mm. this was like a whole page right up that is amazing like it's almost a biography (laughs) she had an obituary in the new york times not too shabby not too shabby for the descendant uh like her grandmother had been a slave her mom bought her freedom and and then she like in new york they're talking about this woman of color that died in louisiana that's fucking amazing it's fucking amazing yeah and she was buried in her family tomb at the saint louis cemetery which i have been to now if you want to go too many people go to those cemeteries and um graffiti which is so fucked up well i don't think i some of it's graffiti because it's fucked up but some of it is um people trying to like okay so now they have it so whenever you want to go view one of those cemeteries you have to go with a court uh a tour group mm-hmm. and um the group we did the tours by foot <laughs> they also do some tours there but it was because um like blue is considered a really um strong color in voodoo or at least new orleans voodoo so people were going at night and painting her tomb blue oh. and so it's not necessarily people being disrespectful yeah but it was still like okay this is a historic site let's not yeah, come in let's and paint not it come paint it it's yeah. not your business to do that exactly if she wanted it painted blue she would have painted it fucking blue well yeah <laughs> sure <laughs> Um, but anyway, it, yeah, that's another thing to do if y'all go to New Orleans, do the cemetery tours. Um, so let's talk about her <laughs> legacy because, whoo, it's a doozy. Oh, hey, hey. it's a doozy. <laughs> Where to begin? Well, first of all, like, right after she died, people would whisper that they'd seen her recently. Like, I seen her walking the streets of New Orleans. Oh, my that's God. That's probably her daughter, but okay. <laughs> And the world literally let their imaginations just run wild with Mm -hmm. her legacy. Mm -hmm. These tales... Again, have you seen American Horror Story? Yeah, right. (laughs) The only thing they got right is that she was a hairdresser. She, there is no way she looked anything like Angela Bassett. Though, God, I wish I looked like Angela uh, Bassett. Angela Bassett. God, oh. Does that woman age? No, she's God a voodoo. She's voodoo. Maybe she it's is. Voodoo magic. It's voodoo magic. But she, or it could be her daughter. <laughs> it could be Angela Bassett's daughter. But no, Marie didn't look anything like that. She also wasn't. Oh God, there's just so many things in um pop culture paint her yeah as... like the, the the tales about how she would use voodoo dolls to hurt people but they and... don't talk about all the people that she desperately tried to save their lives exactly you know? all the negative shit that yeah. they talked about her was just fucking garbage absolutely in reality she was just a very spiritual woman who understood that different walks of lives can coincide if you give them a reason to come together and maybe you make a dime off of some people while you're doing it. Yeah, the ones that gossip too much. Fuck them. And so, cheers to fucking Marie, the voodoo queen of New Orleans. Love you, girl. Yes. So, thanks for listening. If there's something you want to hear, just, like, hit us up. You can email us at queenshistorypodcast at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter. We're at queens underscore podcast. We're on SoundCloud and Stitcher. And follow us on iTunes at queenspodcast, all one word. All smushed up. Queens podcast. <laughs>